Welcome, everyone. My name is Dave Meany. I'm the Senior Associate Dean at the University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering and Applied Science. I'm your host for Penn Engineering's Innovation in Impact podcast. Our podcast shares insights from some of the leading experts from around the world who are either at Penn or more specifically in Penn Engineering. These are the faculty and the researchers who are bringing the latest breakthroughs across a range of fields, one of which we'll talk about today, and we hope it'll inspire people to look at the things that we do in different light and importantly from the impact that we have on the world outside of us. Today's podcast is about RNA, both the history of RNA, what the excitement is today about RNA, as well as some look into the future about how RNA-based technologies could really change the world as we see it today. We're fortunate to have two faculty from our engineering school joining us for the podcast. Those two faculty have either been part of the school for a few years or are just joining the school. So joining me are my colleagues, Dr. Noor Momin, uh, who will be joining us officially in January 2024, and also Dr. Mike Mitchell, who's been with Penn Engineering for about five years. Both of these are experts in the field of RNA-based technology. And what we'll do today is to ask them questions that might be on your minds as well about where this is now and where this is heading into the future. I think I'll start with Dr. Mitchell. And uh, Mike, I know you the best. Uh, so I do uh, promise to you uh, that I'll, I'll be nice to you uh, for the podcast. But um, Mike is an associate professor uh, in the bioengineering department. Um, one of the things about Mike is that his research program is incredibly collaborative. I say that Mike is a part of the engineering school, but he is as much a part of the university as he is part of the engineering school. The reason for that, and you'll learn this throughout the podcast, is that he has an incredible knowledge about how to design drug delivery vehicles, how to get drugs where they need to go within the human body. He's also an inventor of new technologies. Um, one of the technologies I'm sure he'll talk about today is how to protect RNA uh, when it's administered to people and needs to get to the right place. And then finally, he uses many of these applications to diseases that we all know, uh, one of which uh, is cancer. Mike's been part of the faculty now for about five years, and it's amazing to me to see how much uh, he's extended his reach. Uh, so my first question to Mike is, Mike, when you were in school, uh, let's say in college, studying to become an engineer, did you ever imagine that as you were a professor now, you were living in an age and doing the research that you're doing with so much excitement around the work that you're doing? It's a great question, Dave, and I had absolutely no idea. I actually didn't even become, so I'm in the bioengineering department at Penn, I didn't even become a biomedical engineer until my junior year of college, I didn't know what I wanted to do in engineering. I was great in science, I was great in math, but I didn't know how to apply it. And on a whim, I took a bioengineering class in junior year, and I found it fascinating. Everything we learned about differential equations, engineering, circuits, chemistry. This bioengineering class took it all, put it all together for me, and it really changed my trajectory, and it was pretty late in my undergrad career that I changed to a biomedical engineering major. And then from there, it took me in exciting new directions and doing a PhD and then a postdoc in Bob Langer's lab at MIT. But I never could have imagined even five years ago where we would be now with these technologies. It's incredible. Um, I'm jealous of my own students. What they're doing for their PhD now is so exciting, uh, and I'm so excited for them. So we also have Nor Moment. As I mentioned, Nor is joining us uh, in just a few months formally. And... Because she's joining us, I have to just give you a little bit of a window into how we learned about Noor, how we were really excited about the work that Noor is doing. And also, finally, when she came and talked about the work that she wanted to do, she was a perfect match for not just the department in the school, but also uh, for the university. One of the areas that Noor works in is this fascinating area about how to control 
and ultimately engineer therapies that understand the immune system that is in each of us and optimizes each of our immune systems so that we can fight different diseases or in Nora's case, uh, and she'll talk a bit about this, um, some things like cardiovascular disease and the consequences of acute cardiovascular injury. So Nor, welcome. Of course, I have a question for you. And this is that juncture where you're starting your career, you're starting the next phase of your life. Um, we're delighted to have you. And similar to Mike, did you ever imagine at this point uh, you would be joining at a time where the things that you do are not just important to people within the school, but people well outside the school? Definitely not. Um, when I first saw my future as um, a high school student and as a college student even, I thought I would go to medical school. And it wasn't until I had gotten a little bit more research experience in um, undergrad that I realized this is exactly the right place for me. I'm kind of built like an engineer. I like asking difficult questions and I need an outlet for my creativity. And that's um, perfectly matched in bioengineering. Um, and then the specific focus that I fell in love, it, love with was the immune system um, and all the potential applications it has in revolutionizing treatments of diseases from cancer all the way to cardio. Um, so that's the entire trajectory, but I did not see this becoming my future reality. I'm really excited at this juncture. Well, we're excited and delighted that you're with us. I thought I would just start with some of the building blocks of the technology, because we are an engineering school, and when people hear about RNA as a technology, maybe, Mike, I'll uh, go to you first, and then, Nor, uh, I'll ask you to follow, which is, what is RNA? What does it do for us? And why is it so useful as an engineering technology? Yeah, so I'll start with, you know, really RNA as a technology. Um, there's many different things we could do with RNA as a technology, and I really think of it as a platform technology. If we think about, in the case of different types of RNA, if we think of messenger RNA, what we can use mRNA for is if it gets into a cell type of interest and it gets released into a cell, we could use mRNA to create different proteins. And these proteins can be used for different applications. They could be a protein for a vaccine. They could be a protein for a cancer therapeutic. They could be a protein that enables CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. And what makes mRNA so exciting is simply by changing the sequence of that mRNA, which is now very simple to do, we can create many different mRNAs uh, that encode for many different proteins. But mRNA is just one type of technology. There's what we call small interfering RNA. This allows us to silence gene expression in the body. If we have a cancerous mutation in a cell and it's producing proteins that trigger cancer, we could use siRNA to silence it. Um, and there's many others that I won't get into. There's guide RNA, there's circular RNA. These new RNAs, these new technologies that are forming are leading to many new applications that are going to revolutionize pharmaceuticals. So, Mike, maybe I'll follow, uh, which it sounds like mRNA, at least, is a way to flip a switch on or off in a cell. Is that switch permanent? Is the technology such that, as you say, the RNA enters the cell does it ever leave? Does the effect, is that a permanent effect? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, uh, Dave. Um, and what I would say about mRNA technology is it's short-lived. We call it transient when it's in a cell. Uh, it'll typically get into a cell type of interest. It will make a therapeutic protein. It'll make a protein for a vaccine. But that mRNA will typically go away within 24 to 48 hours. And that could be great for certain applications um, where you don't want the mRNA sitting in your cell for long periods of time. But we're also thinking about mRNA for ways that can we make it last a week? If we have a cancer patient who needs an mRNA cancer therapy, they can't get injected with mRNA every single day. So there are scientists that are now thinking about, including our lab, can we make that mRNA last longer so a patient could come to the hospital every two weeks or every month for their therapy? So RNA is often described as a building block technology, and that is 
uh, it can be used for many different purposes. Mike talked a little bit about some of the applications in cardiovascular diseases and disorders of which you're a specialist. How is it different or similar to what Mike was talking about? It's actually very similar because um, when you think about what Mike said, MR, um, mRNA is a platform, siRNA, these small interfering RNA that he mentioned, also a platform. Um, and it's just about fine tuning what's exactly encoded. So in the grand scheme of things, when we are defining RNA, this is um, the bridging molecule between two larger families of macromolecules, the DNA and the proteins. And so it's acting in multiple ways to help that DNA, that genetic code, turn into proteins. And mRNA plays a critical role in turning in turning all of that expression on and turning it off. And so you can see it um, affecting that entire cycle. And then in the field of cardiovascular disease, we have um, investigative drugs looking into, can we increase the protein expression by delivering mRNA um, to alleviate heart failure? This is a Moderna trial. We also have um, siRNA um, to address um, a lot of cholesterol that might be building up in the body in certain um, hereditary um, diseases. Um, so this is another application of um, RNA of different types in the cardio field. So maybe if I could follow on that, because your background, of course, is immunology as well. Mm -hmm. As an engineer, you're trying to see nature's system for defending us against uh, what we see around us. And then from an engineering standpoint, really uh, deciding how you can augment that through some of these technologies. We've seen the most potent example of RNA medicine to date of the vaccines. Yeah. Um, for the applications that you just talked about, are vaccines working in the same way or are they working in a different way? Maybe explain that. So um, the application in the cardiovascular field, I guess, is an extension of RNA not as a vaccine. It's using RNA um, to just increase or decrease the levels of proteins that we've thought are path found to be pathogenic. Um, but the use of mRNA as a vaccine extends beyond um, its use in infectious diseases. Mike alluded to the fact that they're using it in cancer therapy, and this can be used to create personalized vaccines against particular um, cancer types by sequencing patients' tumors and understanding what are some unique molecules that are expressed that you would want to alert the body's immune system to. Um, so this is just um, the beginning of many applications of RNA as vaccines, not just infectious disease, but cancer and potentially a lot of other diseases as well. So the notion of a cancer vaccine is fascinating to me because Cancer, at least when I look at it, is something that none of us want to have, but we can't predict when we're going to have it if we have it. And the vaccine, the notion of a cancer vaccine, completely changes everything so that it becomes something that we might even prevent with yeah. a vaccine. Yeah, it's almost a misnomer a little bit because of the fact that vaccines, the way we administer them for infectious diseases is to prevent um, this disease from being as severe or, pr or protect you from it if you were to contract this disease. And then um, in the case of a cancer vaccine, we're more describing um, the principles of vaccination, um, alerting the immune system, getting it ready to fight something. Um, but in the setting for treatments um, using a cancer vaccine, you already have the malignancy. So it's not a prophylactic preventative um, treat, uh, course, but instead a treatment itself. So um, at least the vaccines I'm describing are um, some of well, these personalized vaccines are the ones that are used as treatments. But of course, there are also cancer vaccines or vaccines to prevent um, um, infectious diseases that are linked to cancers later on. So one of the things, again, we mentioned at the beginning, RNA is a technology. And it's been known at the highest level in biology to do some of the things that both of you just said. It's almost like nature's program um, where it takes instructions from the DNA and it acts on those instructions to make proteins and have an effect. What are the other uses of RNA technology that either might extend beyond what both of you have talked about and even go into other areas, say the environment? Mike, maybe you want to 
take a, a first stab at that. Yeah, I mean, there have been many applications uh, that have been explored for RNA technologies, Dave. Um, there's so many um, in healthcare uh, that we're working on now. Uh, our lab is even working on before a child is born, can we use RNA to edit out deadly mutations in a child that might cause them to die shortly after birth? There might be a unique therapeutic window where we could actually deliver this RNA to a child right before they're born. Uh, but you bring up R RNA in the environment as well. People are using RNA and other types of nucleic acids to genetically engineer crops as well. This could be with siRNA to silence gene expression. I have colleagues at other universities who are using RNA-based uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology uh, to edit crops as well uh, for different applications, either making them more resistant uh, to survive in different temperatures or to just get the right characteristics that you want. Uh, the applications are well beyond uh, healthcare. And then beyond, um, I think we alluded to a lot of treatments, so preventative vaccines and treatments for diseases, but it's also RNA as a molecule is used diagnostically as well. So we have, um, even when we were going through this pandemic, all of us took at some point a PCR test. And so this PCR test is detecting the RNA. Um, and so even though it's not used um, therapeutically in this case, it's still very important in that entire medical pipeline to identify certain infectious um, agents and diagnose a disease in order to treat it properly. And, and let me pick up on that good example, which is, uh, as you say, this test polymerase chain reaction, PCR. It, is that a sensitive test? In the pandemic, we heard many tests that were available, some of which would detect the underlying RNA that would indicate an infection. Is there an advantage to using an RNA-based technology over others? Or um, I, I would say in terms of the sensitivity, um, it is sensitive in detecting um, the presence of RNA that would be associated with a particular infectious disease. And it was often compared, at least in the case of these COVID diagnostics, against an antigen um, detecting method. And so this is detecting the presence of the protein that an mRNA would eventually be encoding. Um, and these, these detections work more like a pregnancy test and may have some um, sensitivity issues that aren't necessarily attributed to detecting RNA. So in general, the RNA detection appears to be more sensitive, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. No, I agree. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that comes up when people talk about these technologies in the future is, I would imagine you wouldn't want to administer it so that it goes everywhere in the body, but you could develop, say, a second technology platform that uses RNA plus, let's say, a material that encases this molecule mRNA so that it goes to the right place at the right time. And Mike, some of your background is in this broad area of drug delivery, but I would say that it's much more nuanced nowadays, whereas in the past, you would only think about getting it safely into the body, but now you're talking about targeting. Can you speak a little bit about where we stand and what the future looks like there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my lab works on what we call these drug delivery technologies. Uh, and as Dave said, part of the job is protecting the RNA. RNA is very fragile. It degrades very rapidly. It's also highly charged. Uh, so our cells in the body are charged. RNA is charged. It's very hard to get over that repulsion. So we design nanoparticle technologies to get it into the cell types of interest. And this works well as a vaccine, Dave, because as you mentioned, the vaccine is relatively a more simple example of delivery. We're injecting it into the muscle. We want it to get into immune cells. We want it to go into what are known as our lymph nodes to initiate this vaccine response. But now that we have the vaccines, people want to develop therapeutics. And therapeutics typically aren't injected intramuscularly in our lymph nodes. They're typically injected into the bloodstream. But of course, 
our blood vessels are throughout our body. If we want to get something into a tumor, for example, uh, can we do that? Yes. But then the question is, what if it goes into your liver and it becomes toxic and you get liver failure? That's where drug delivery comes in. We design these nanoparticles in a way that they're almost like a heat-seeking missile in that they could go to a tissue of interest that you want. This could be through what is known as a lock and key mechanism binding to a cell type of interest. And that could allow us to enrich for that RNA loaded nanoparticle at the site of interest while potentially avoiding what we call healthy clearance organs where we might not want that RNA or particle to go to. And what's been fascinating, I guess, to just build off of that is Mike's technology not only does um, targeting to different organs, but to different cell types, which brings our targeting ability even more fi and fine tunes it even more. Yes, so absolutely. that's the impressive part. I just wanted to emphasize that as well. Mm -hmm. And Nor, when I talked at the beginning about you being knowledgeable about the immune system and understanding how to control that in some way, maybe talk a bit about how that comes together, both in your own work and more broadly. With respect to the RNA, um, so I guess when you have RNA present in the, it, at least in these cases where we're talking about delivering RNA to s particular cells, if you have RNA that's present that shouldn't be there, your body automatically re responds against it because it could look sometimes like you have an infection, a viral infection. And so there have been a lot of um, clever modifications that were a lot of them spearheaded here at Penn. Um, to prevent that aberrant immune response or the natural immune response that you're trying to avoid because you're eventually trying to deliver something therapeutic. So that's been an interesting um, mergence of the RNA field with the immune field and um, a hurdle that was overcome here. And how personal is that immune response? Is my immune re response different to the same pathogen or same molecule that's around us? So these immune responses to something as simple as RNA, which is a basic building block, is part of our innate immune response. And so this is shared across all of us um, and will be pretty similar across the three of us at this table and everyone else who will be watching. Um, but there's another segment to the immune response is adaptive immune response, what we're trying to trigger with these vaccines using these mRNA vaccines, and that will be a little bit more unique. Um, and it's just the evolutionary case. So, Nora, I'm going to turn to you and talk a little bit more about other parts of what we do as professors. Uh, you're just joining us, and one of the things that we also do is teach students, we mentor students, whether they're undergraduates or graduate students, and you'll have the courses planned for you to teach. If, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about what you're teaching and, and what you'd like to bring to the students today that was perhaps based on what you learned as a student, some of the excitement looking forward in the future. Yeah, so, um the teaching element and the mentoring element is a big driving factor for me to be in academia. Um, the course I'm teaching is yet to be determined, but it will be immunology and immunoengineering related. Um, but um, with respect to the mentorship element that I'm excited to get um, underway, it's um, really, really uh, incredible because I've been inspired by all the mentors I've had in the past. And part of the mentorship style that they've kind of imbued in me is you really encourage students, you show them that science is really collaborative and that you're gonna be working with a lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds and it's about integrating um, all this experience. And so inspiring that next generation to have that same collaborative mentality um, is uh, something that motivates me and is something I'm really excited about. And then Mike, how about you? The question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's checking his Twitter troll. <laughs> um, you've been with us now five years. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you've really been a big part of not just 
being a part of the school and the department, but a part of the university. There's a tremendous amount of excitement at Penn. You've seen it firsthand. You've also seen it in students that you've taught, undergraduates um, as well as graduate students. And can you talk a little bit about as you look forward, um, what do you think you'll be teaching them five or 10 years from now that's different than what you're teaching them today based on the science? Yeah, that's a great question, Dave. And, you know, I see it in my own lab now. We write research articles. Um, we have an introduction in those articles where we give somewhat of a history of that field leading up to it. And by the time my lab publishes on these RNA lipid nanoparticle technologies, by the time we get the paper back six months later, the field's already outdated. That's how fast the field is moving now. Um, so I love the uh, context uh, uh, that I teach in my biomaterials class. I think that class is an undergraduate class. We teach sophomores the fundamentals of biomaterials, but those students are also very hungry for applications for those materials. What can we do with polymers, metals, or ceramics? Um, so I think what excites me about this class is biomaterials is something that's going to be constantly evolving. There's always going to be new technologies from biology uh, and genetics and medicine, new proteins, new RNAs, new drugs, but it's always going to require new biomaterials to make them compatible and be delivered in a targeted manner to cells in the body. Um, so. I'm at a point right now where every year I'm challenging myself and really bringing the latest applications in biotechnology, biomaterials to my students. Um, and I see something like this continuously evolving year after year. So, Nora, I'll go to you and ask you a question of how you see us now. And again, you were interviewing to be a professor at different places. I know that many people were interested at different places in having you join uh, the faculty. What stood out to you about us? I've been here many years, so I'm a little tainted by my experience. But I I'm curious, when you saw us, when you learned more about us, what did you see? Because I'm sure many of these factors are things that you couldn't read from a website, you couldn't get from just a short conversation with someone at a meeting. Honestly, it comes back to what I had said about wanting to teach my students about collaboration and working together. And I couldn't help but notice when I was here that all the faculty are so interconnected. Um, everyone has their own specialty, but no one shies away from working together and finding a new area where both um, specialties can merge and operating in this new interface. And that um, collaboration is really what drew me to Penn. Um, and that's why I'm excited to train students here to give them that same excitement and value about how much collaboration is important in making super impactful discoveries down the road. Mike, I'm going to take a different tack with you. Um, people have uh, commented to me how impressed they are with your hair. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe if you could offer some tips, uh, hair products to recommend, uh, who cuts your hair, uh, just to get to know you as a person a little bit. <laughs> so shameless plug, a big, big shout out to uh, Mirror Mantle uh, in Fittler Square in Philadelphia. Uh, I've never paid more for a haircut in my life, uh, $70 per haircut, but I love all the girls there. They do an amazing job with my hair. They could take as much money as possible. Um, I attribute it to that. Uh, my girlfriend and I, we don't have kids yet, so I still get eight hours of sleep a night. So uh, <laughs> I've been able to keep my hair thus far. Uh, and I do want to know <laughs> which students have been asking these questions. I'm taking names. <laughs> no, no. It was an anonymous portal. Of course um. it was. <laughs> I'm just glad you got that question and I didn't get that question. <laughs> well, this has been incredibly informative for me personally. I knew both of you um, and I now know more about you, even from the short time we've had together. And I, I really appreciate the time uh, that you've taken from your busy schedules. Nora, I know you're looking uh, for places to live and uh, taking away time from that. Uh, I'm really grateful. Um, and I also want to thank the audience for spending the time and joining us and, and learning about who we are and how we see parts of the future. Uh, please subscribe 
to our Penn Engineering's Innovation and Impact podcast on different platforms. And you can also see a recording of this on a YouTube channel. Thank you.